Hi everyone, I'm Hans Ulrich Obrist, I'm the Artistic Director of the Serpentine Galleries and delighted to join you today at the Driving the Humans Festival in Karlsruhe. I thank you so much to Peter Weibel, thank you to Jan Boren. It's a great pleasure to participate in this long durational festival, which will last for three years from 2020 to 2023, which I think is very fascinating because at the Serpentine we've been thinking a lot also lately about slow programming and how we can actually work with more sustainable marathon type of formats. Um, so it's fascinating that you do a conference which lasts three years. And of course, this idea of it being a catalyst for experimentation, addressing themes of, um, of climate change, of science, of technology, of the arts. Uh, we can only address the big topics, the big themes of the 21st century, as we believe also at the Serpentine, if we go beyond the fear of pulling knowledge, if we break down silos, if we find ways actually of um, creating what Isabel Stengers and uh, Ilya Prigozhin called many years ago in their wonderful book, New Alliances. We need new alliances, not only between universities, knowledge production institutions, museums, Kunsthalles, but also all kinds of other organizations in society. Something we feel is very important right now uh, is to multiply these new alliances. I was asked today by Jan uh, to talk actually about It's Urgent, and I suppose that the It's Urgent exhibition, which uh, we did this summer in Al with Luma Al resonates somehow with what's happening in Karlsruhe at the moment. Uh, it's Urgent was inspired by conversations I had for many, many years with my friend and mentor, the Martinican philosopher, Edouard Glissant, who often talked about this idea that he observes that the places in which exhibitions are traditionally presented are actually invisible to large sections of society. So he encouraged me to think about other forms of engagement and more generous models, open source exhibitions uh, that are extremely mobile and reach places where one would never expect to see art. It's a little bit what Robert Musil once said when he says, you know, to create situations where we can actually encounter art where we expect it least. Wo man der Kunst dort begegnen kann, wo man es am wenigsten erwartet. Glisson imagined art institutions of the future as archipelagos, as networks, as interrelationship between different cultures based on the values very much so of, of network perspectives. His archipelago concept, so the concept of the archipelago, which was so central in his thinking, uh, promotes dialogue and diversity and proposes syncretic systems of thought reflective of a polycentric world. Glisson has talked to me often about the value of an art institution that would harbor a quest for the unknown, a safe haven where worlds are brought into contact with each other. So this idea of creating actually contact of many different worlds as something which we should achieve within art institution. And uh, Glisson has been a great inspiration for Luma and actually Luma Al to incorporate those into the program. The project started before Al actually in Denmark. It's interesting that there was a concrete uh, political uh, actually occasion which prompted it. It was the campaign for the European Parliament in 2019 and I was asked by the uh, Charlottenburg Kunsthalle and the Hart and Festival in Denmark to do an exhibition where artists could actually talk about Europe and uh, the idea uh, of thinking of a dialogue. Uh, it was very inspired by Etel Adnan and what Etel actually wrote once for my Instagram, the world needs togetherness, not separation, love, not suspicion, a common future, not isolation. And if we think about togetherness, love, and common future and ways to resist separation, suspicion, and isolation, it seemed an important theme really at that moment of these European elections for the artists and the project continued to grow. After that, we invited more and more artists actually, first of all, also in Zurich, at the Luma Vespa, and then during the lockdown, the exhibition actually um, uh, evolved and we showed it this summer uh, at Luma Al. And uh, it was free really for the artists to come up with the theme they felt would be urgent. So we could see many posters related to ecology, to inequality, uh, and to the theme of anti-racism, social justice, uh, common future. These are somehow uh, the most frequently addressed themes, I would say, and um, uh, very grateful to Maya Hoffman for this amazing process to actually, uh, together with Maya, let this exhibition evolve, because it was Maya who said, yeah, let's just continue to invite artists, don't stop, and uh, the exhibition, of course, has reached now more than 140 posters, you can see some here in the background, uh, and uh, the exhibition will continue in many different cities, because it's an exhibition which can actually 
be downloaded and um, uh, basically be locally printed, locally produced. And the root of the game is also that there will always be local artists invited, no matter where the exhibition goes. And here is yet another, I would say, influence from uh, Edouard Glissant, which is this idea from the archipelago to the mondialité, because mondialité is another key notion in the Glissantian vocabulary. And uh, Glissant really felt uh, two, he saw two movements in a way, he saw two dangers. He felt that we have a homogenizing globalization. He, it's not the first time the world experiences globalization. There have been previous or prior moments to globalization. But as Glissant pointed out in my conversations with him, this is certainly without a doubt the most extreme and fooled by technology, also most violent moment of uh, globalization the planet has ever experienced. So Glissant said we need to resist these homogenizing forces of globalization because they will lead to an ecological disaster, they will lead to extinction of species, to a mass extinction, but they will also lead to an extinction of many cultural phenomena, which um, would mean, of course, languages. There is a mass extinction and ever-increasing extinction of languages, but also other phenomena, like, for example, on my Instagram, a kind of a previous project to the It's Urgent project are these post-its where every day I invite artists on, on my Instagram to actually celebrate doodling and handwriting at a moment where we felt it was somehow in danger and might, might disappear. So Glissant's first point is to resist the homogenizing forces of globalization. However, Glissant also saw early on in a very uh, premonitoire, I think in English the word would be premonitory, way he anticipated that uh, second trend, which is actually uh, a counter-reaction to the homogenized forces of globalization, an extreme counter-reaction, which would be new forms of localism, new forms of um, nationalism, new forms of lack of tolerance, and Glissant said that needs to be vehemently resisted as well. And that brings us to, to mondialité. Glissant felt that we need a, a global dialogue which can actually listen, a global dialogue which can um, basically further uh, an understanding of each other, but at the same time not homogenize. And that's exactly what I think exhibitions, what cultural institutions in the 21st century can do. It's the reason why every morning when I wake up, it's one of my rituals. Um, I would read for 15 minutes Edouard Glissant. I was getting this mindset, you know, what today can I do? And I think it's interesting that we ask ourselves that today in the context of your conference. You know, what can we do to contribute to the Glissantian idea of mondialité? And we discussed this also this summer in a very socially distanced meeting, actually, where we at the Medico Social in the Parc des Ateliers, uh, invited some of the artists because that was the whole idea to actually invite artists to locally add posters. Uh, if it's Sarah Sadik, if it's Julien Creuset, uh, a whole list of about 15 to 20 artists have over the summer uh, added art, added added posters uh, in the in the local context of of Arles, of France, uh, and um, and that is something where where the exhibition actually very much connects also to do it because um, an exhibition which we reactivated during the lockdown which has also a lot to do with uh, mondialité and is very inspired by, by Glissant is the do it uh, exhibition where we invited artists um, to write instructions do it yourself instruction uh, it's a project which uh, has been uh, happening a lot during quarantine while the physical mobility is actually restricted uh, art, of course, can be a way to experience life beyond one's immediate circumstances, uh, whether it is, you know, through pain, through words, through music, through food or another medium. Artists all wrote instructions, uh, do-it-yourself instructions, and that project has actually started in '93 and has ever since happened in 165 cities, and each time it happens, the local context enters, it grows. So it is a um, a question also, I think, Bernard Stiegler asked in my last conversation I had with him. It was very ominous. He all of a sudden said, Comment peut on être local sans être localiste? And that, I think, in addition to the Glissantian idea of, of, uh, of mondialité, is a very important question. How can we be local without being localist? And it brings us back, of course, also to the archipelago, because the Antillean archipelago geography has been the great inspiration for the Glissant thinking because these islands are a group that has no center but consists of a string of different islands and of different cultures. The exchange that takes place between them, between those islands, allows each to preserve 
uh, their own identity. To quote Edouard Glisson here from a conversation I had with him, the American archipelagos are extremely important because it was in these islands that the idea of creolization, that is the blend of cultures, was most brilliantly fulfilled. Continents reject mixings, whereas archipelic thought makes it possible to say that neither each person's identity nor the collective identity are fixed and established once and for all. I can change through the exchange with the other without losing or diluting my sense of self. And it is that archipelic thought can teach us." End of quote. So in a way, Glissant's idea know that we can change through the exchange with the other without losing or diluting our sense of self is of course exactly what is at the core of this idea of mondialité. It is also fascinating that Glissant had actually imagined um, an institution which could, um, an institution which could in a way maybe bring together all these mondialité and archipelago ideas. He wanted to build it in Martinique and it was very advanced, worked with his artist friends, Segi, also Mata, and um, uh, I think Wilfredo Lama also was very involved. And that, of course, is part of Glissant's other aspect, which I think makes him so relevant for now, that his activities as a poet, as a philosopher, as a public intellectual, and as a curator, not only encompass literary and theoretical work, but that he permanently kind of went into the production of reality. So already, when he was very young, he was part of the resistance and spoke out in favor of Martinique's independence, was friends with Franz Fanon. And then, of course, from 1967 onwards, he uh, very importantly did the Institut Martinique d'Etude. He, he, he co-founded this school, uh, which was an agent for change, which was intervening in political issues and also implemented, most importantly, Creole in the center of that school system. And this within a school system actually dominated by, by French. Uh, so a, a really, really extraordinary school, which, as uh, Patrick Chamoiseau pointed out to me recently, was influential for generations and generations of students. So this idea of him as a public intellectual sort of producing reality. And that's, of course, why he imagined and prepared a museum for Martinique. And that remained unrealized. But we can today visit, in a way, these ideas. We can, I think there are a toolbox for us to build the future of the museum, because Glissant imagined, as mentioned, the museum as an archipelago, which would not house a synthesis, but a network of interrelationship. He wanted to uh, create a museum which would not only point at urgencies, but also, and that's, I think, very important, uh, be, go beyond this idea of pointing at urgencies, and actually find agency, enable agency, give agency to respond to these urgencies. So he imagined it to be a quivering place which would transcend established systems of thought and which would be looking for the utopian point where all the world's cultures and all the world's imaginations can meet and hear another. And that, again, I think is a very beautiful definition of what, as a curator, as a museum director, I think today I'm looking for. I'm looking for this utopian point where all the world's cultures and all the world's imaginations can meet and can hear another. And, of course, that's also where his whole thinking of Glissant on utopia is very relevant because he was very critical of classical utopia, such as Plato's Republic or Thomas More's Utopia, because he saw them as conceived as static systems and, and hence rejected them. He, he designed a, a new alternative form of utopia consisting of a continuous dialogue. And of course, when Ernst Bloch was pushed against the wall by Adorno to finally, finally, finally define what is utopia, Ernst Bloch told Adorno something is missing. And that idea is very directly leading us to one of Glissant's most important and unfortunately not often translated books called Sartorius. Sartorius from 1999 describes the utopian Batutu people who derive the identity not from a genealogy, but actually solely from being in constant exchange with others. So there isn't a genealogical identity. There is a relational identity. And Glissant referred to this as actually a trembling utopia, not l'utopie comme tremblement, the trembling utopia, because it transcends established systems of thought and subjects itself to the unknown. And I think many of the posters really for its urgent have to do with this idea, this Glissantian idea of a trembling utopia, so important to many artists now. To quote Glissant, 
it must be said from the start, and this is another quote from my many conversations I'm working at the moment, I'm actually bringing them together as a book because I think it's so important that we make this on thought more accessible in English. And so this is another quote from these infinite conversations. Glisson told me, it must be said from the start that trembling is not uncertainty and not fear. Trembling thought, and in my opinion, every utopia passes through this kind of thought, is first of all, the instinctive feeling that we must reject all categories of fixed thought and all categories of imperial thought. The all world, le tout monde, the all world trembles, the all world trembles physically, the all world trembles geologically, the all world trembles mentally, the all world trembles spiritually, because the all world is looking for the point, not the station, but the utopian point where all the world's cultures and also all the world's imaginations can meet and can hear one another without dispersing or losing themselves. So this idea of actually listening is, is also very important as part of that. Uh, as Etel Adnan says, uh, the poet and, uh, and writer and visual artist who is now in her mid-90s, she always said what is really so important in the 21st century is to, um, is to learn again to listen. Now, another thing I think which is part of its urgent, and I know I'm soon running out of time, uh, I promise that this short talk for your conference would not be a marathon, so I'll come to a conclusion. But there is one last point I wanted to say, which is, of course, the idea also of, um, the idea also of art for, for all, the idea of a democratization of art. It's uh, Sandra Perry, uh, the artist who did Typhoon coming on at the supper time recently says, when making a piece, I want people to feel like they have space and agency. And uh, this idea also actually of um, uh, thinking about uh, how we can use technology to combat oppression and surveillance is very important in Sandra's work. And uh, the practice is committed to net neutrality, ideas of collective production, action, using open source software to edit the work and leasing it digitally to classrooms and make it available free online. And that's very much, I think, what the poster project, what the It's Urgent project, what Do It, what my Instagram project is about. These are open source projects which can continue to grow, to evolve. And uh, there are no obstacles for someone to actually realize their own It's Urgent project. It can happen in museums, but it can happen, happen in universities. It can also happen in people's homes, which is why actually for the uh, exhibition it's urgent in, in, in Al, we also made it possible for visitors to download the posters and then, you know, print about themselves. Whilst in Zurich, we had a different kind of rule of the game where visitors could take smaller versions of the poster away with them and then um, put them up in at home or in different parts of the city or wherever they, you know, would feel... Uh, it, it could happen. So, um, yeah, it's urgent. Uh, thank you all so much for for being here uh, today. And uh, uh, I hope we'll meet again soon, uh, soon in person. I would also like to invite you all uh, to actually um, follow It's Urgent online on Luma Al, where you can find some interviews and some conversations. Soon we will have a book uh, designed by Norm, the Swiss graphic designer with all the posters, uh, this will not be the end. This is the end of chapter three, and we hope that the exhibition will also continue to then evolve in many places. We'll continue to listen. And of course, wherever the exhibition goes, we will have new posters, and I hope that like Do It, it will become an archive. And uh, in a way, I think um, Alexis Pauline Gumps has written a trilogy, which has for me been during the lockdown of the uh, last few months, really the biggest inspiration um, and uh, talks about this idea that it's not so much, again, not the glissantian idea of genealogy, of influence, but it's about thinking with someone else. No? And so for me, I'm thinking with Edouard Glissant. For me, all these projects I do, grew, they grow out of, of my thinking with, with Glissant. And for um, Alexis Pauline Gams, it's actually thinking with another visionary, uh, with Sylvia Vinton, who is, of course, someone who has been studying the multiple histories of knowledge. And I want to end here with that because Alexis Pollingham's, you know, working with, uh, thinking with Sylvia Winter says that we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other through social media, technology, to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way actually that allows us to be 
in communion with our environment as opposed to a dominating colonialist separation from the environment. And that, of course, brings us back also to the overall theme of your conference. It brings us back also to the exhibition, which I saw this summer, uh, the fascinating exhibition, Peter Weibel and Bruno Latour and their teams have organized critical zones where uh, basically the visitor is invited to, uh, you know, yeah, to deal with the situation of the earth in various ways. And there is an interesting connection actually to our Serpentine project, which is going to uh, evolve over the next years called Back to Earth, where we invited uh, 50 artists to come up with an environmental campaign. So much more than an exhibition, it will be a campaign and these campaigns will, to, will continue to grow over time. Uh, so it has only just begun. Thank you all so much. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. I just wanted to add the following. Now, the idea of mondialité is, of course, also something we can see in the amazing project of the Atelier Luma. I'm sure that Jan Bölen will tell you more about that because the vision really of, of Maya Hoffman's Luma Al is exactly this glissantine idea of an institution as an archipelago. And uh, this archipelago where there is exchange between so many different islands involves, besides of course projects with art and ecology and society, also many projects with archives, as well as the uh, Atelier Luma, uh, which is a think tank, uh, basically a learning network. It's also a production possibility uh, where new ways of actually producing also with local um, ingredients, with a with local craft, with a local, with basically a connection to a bio region, uh, where where design can be a tool for for transition. So I'm sure Jan Bodem will tell you much more about it. But I just wanted to make that link because I think it's interesting in relation to Maya Hoffman's overall vision, right? Of of Luma being this archipelago, this Glissantian archipelago. I also wanted to mention in this context Enzo Mari, and remember here dedicate actually today's talk. Uh, to the memory of the legendary Enzo Mari, who very sadly passed away, age 88 of the uh, COVID uh, last last week. And uh, I've just curated a show of Enzo Mari together with Francesca Giacomelli, a survey uh, which brings together really my 20 years of dialogue with him. Of course, Mari is part of this amazing generation of Castiglioni, Magistretti, Mendini, Sozzas, Gini Boeri, and uh, uh, a generation of Italian designers who had this amazing opportunity to be paired, to be aligned really with risk-taking manufacturers like Danese, like Driade, and could never have produced this reality. But I think what makes Mari so relevant for what we're discussing today, uh, and so urgent, we could say, you know, and so Mari is urgent, is of course not only that he was so many, you know, had so many dimensions to his work, an industrial designer, a furniture designer, an exhibition maker, an artist, a manifesto writer, a polemicist. No, but it's really the idea of the sustainability of the of the accessibility because his objects were made to last for good. As former Fantasma say, you know, one would never throw an Enzo Mari object away. And it's very difficult that things can last. And there is never a, a disposable waste of, of, uh, of resources with Mari. So not even... With a with a calendar, you know, where usually a calendar is a disposable object. No, it, Mari's calendars are eternal. We can always revisit them every year again and again. I've had a Mari calendar since I'm a since I'm a student. Now, the other thing I think which makes him relevant is that he wanted to get rid of this idea of profit, of commercialization, of industry in designs, uh, of, uh, because for him, design for Mari was about communicating knowledge, and so it's not by coincidence that he did a open source project, which is very connected to what I've been talking about today, to its urgent, to do it, to these exhibition models, which try to be generous. I think generosity kind of is their medium. And of course, the Autoprogettazione of Enzo Mari was a great inspiration for me. It's very much in the center of the exhibition in Milano. We've also asked contemporary artists like Dan Vo, Rick Ricciarovani, Dosicanu to revisit the Autoprogettazione. And it's a Self-design, autoprogettazione is the Italian word, uh, autoprogettazione means self-design. It's an exercise to be carried out individually to improve one's personal understanding. So it's a guide to making, really. And it was a great inspiration for Boltanski and Lavier in the 90s, you know, for us to start Do It, which is the exhibition with artist instructions. And um, yes, I think uh, it's important that today we remember Enzo Mari and the exhibition at uh, the Triennale di Milano 
uh, has started uh, last week and uh, I think it's momentarily because of COVID now closed again. But when it reopens, it will most certainly then go into next summer. So hopefully uh, many of you can, can see it.